for me, I think one of the biggest culture shocks was, I remember it was the second day we had been in Germany and my aunt took me to the grocery store because my parents left some pocket change for me so I would buy myself, you know, a chocolate or something. And I remember walking into the grocery store and it was just a different world. I thought, how can this be that not so far away where we have empty shelves here, it was just unbelievable, all the fruit. I remember the smell of these oranges and then my aunt taking me to the to the chocolate aisle. It was an aisle. And I thought, this is not real, that you just have all of this, this abundance, right? So I think it was interesting from a child's perspective to think about how can there be so much, so much food and so much goodness <laughs> compared to what I was used to. And then the the behavior, right, that I remember taking one little bar and I was very happy with that and my aunt said no no you can take more you we can I said no no it's fine it's okay uh, I'm good I want to kind of explain why this is such a exciting time for me in my evolution of podcasting because in the beginning it started out of an interest without as much clarity on where exactly I wanted it to go but through a lot of the conversations because I'm touching on people's generational story understanding through those first-hand experiences of those cultural differences the things that you took from it the things that you maybe decided didn't suit the cultural elements that you liked and also the evolution of culture across the generations. That is the thing that holds so much fascination for me to understand personally and professionally. So honing in on that and then coming across people like you who've dedicated to focusing in on this, you know, cross-cultural awareness and cross-cultural management piece just means that it's, it's even more interesting because it's not just let's see how it's played out in your life. But, you know, let's see why you've decided that this is such a an important but also interesting area for you to form a basis of helping others to understand as well. Can I ask you, <laughs> this is this is a little bit unexpected because what I'm drawing on what you just said. Why is this so interesting for you? Because I find that with most people, and it doesn't really matter what they're working on, there's when we have a strong interest or passion for something, it's also always very personal. So what what is it for you? I think this is something that I have probably only been able to answer in the last two months. So it is great that you're asking. But I've always, ever since, you know, graduating from university, I've loved to travel. And part of that is you know, the easy thing to say that many people will say the same thing. It's seeing new parts of the world, uh, being able to experience nature in a different way, meeting new people. But under that people piece is you get to really understand the different ways that people live. And, you know, I'm sure we'll dive into it. But, you know, all the studies that have been done by people like uh, Hofstede around understanding different cultures one of the main things I picked up from that is that everyone has their own individual personality, but overlaid on top of that are these kind of tendencies and assumptions and even reflex actions that stem from the history of the community they grew up in. And it's so easy to think that, especially if you've grown up in one place and you're surrounded by people that not necessarily have to look like you, but they're similar to you in the environment they grew up in, you see that version of reality as the normal way and anything outside that is different. So my, w there's been a couple of times where I've like really, I remember realizing that quite strongly in the moment. One was when visiting a friend in Italy uh, and there were siblings and they took me out for breakfast on the next day. And obviously we went for a coffee, which is uh, nothing out of the ordinary, but we went to one of the local cafes in Italy and they were like, oh, would you, you know, we can order for you. Would you like a pan au chocolat or um, some other sweet treat? 
And then in a kind of jokey way, but jokey serious, I said, uh, what? Well, I don't want something sweet for breakfast. Who does that? And then they looked at me genuinely as if I was weird. Like, what else do you have then? I'm like, what? Eggs on toast? Amazing. You know, that's a, a go to for me. And they're like, oh, no. Like, why would you have that for breakfast? That's like a lunch dish or whatever. And then I just realized that, wow, there is, you know, I would never dream of having like a heavy pan of chocolate, maybe on a one off. But for them, it is a norm. None of us are right or wrong, but there genuinely was a, we almost saw this as black and white and it wasn't. So that was one. And then even when living in China, same sort of experience, one of the places that I stayed, they provided breakfast if you wanted it. And um, it was, luckily that place had things for non-Chinese people, but also locals. So there were things like eggs and porridge but then what they would have would be very savory, like dumplings or congee, which is like a savory rice version of put it, of porridge. And then they would put stuff like nuts and, and spices in it. And I remember think, seeing that thinking, who has this for breakfast? And again, then when I remember telling uh, one of the girls who worked at reception, I was like, oh yeah, the breakfast is great, but I can't believe that there's something like congee. And they're like, that's what that is a very common thing for people to have for breakfast. And I couldn't imagine ever having it. So th th those are specifically food examples. But I just think after being exposed personally to a lot of these um, differences, I realized like, wow, my version of reality is not the only version. And then maybe that ignited it where then in the workplace, because I work in international with international teams, they operate very differently. And so my way of doing things where it's like okay make sure you start an email or a presentation and highlight the three key points and then go to the description they wouldn't necessarily do that right there's a common flip side where it's they go with the principles first and then they go to the conclusion because they see it in the way of why would i tell you the outcome before i've even explained the starting point like that why why is that a normal way of doing things and you start to realize okay maybe it does help to not think, okay, I need to get people to adjust to my way of thinking, or I need to adjust to way, their way of thinking, just can I actually realize there are differences, and then just slightly tailor my conversation or tailor my approach to it. So yeah, it, it started personally, but then I realized even just for my own professional development, it's super useful to understand these things. Yes, brilliant. Oh, I like that a lot. So that's, yeah, that's kind of my... Um, brief insight to my history but going to yours and you know people who are familiar with the show I like to try and see where that first domino may have dropped not even in your own story but in the stories that came before do you know if there is something either in uh, a generation or two back where you can see where may the, where this you know interest or passion may have come from yes so I gave this quite a bit of thought and obviously I was thinking the people closest to me. So I'm originally Polish. My parents are also both Polish and I'll get into the story of our moving, but up to the age of eight, I lived in Poland. So I was surrounded by people who were speaking the same language, culture, food. However, my grandpa um, on my dad's side, he was an architect and he was a passionate traveler. Uh, he was also an artist, um, which stemmed from his work. He was super creative. But in the city I'm from, we have a very, up till now, uh, we have a huge international fair. And this fair is all year round and it's for different uh, types of industries and fields. And so even back then, uh, my grandfather would design um, these uh, cubicles and sets for different uh, people who would show their products uh, in our um, city. And they were from all over the world. Um, so he was, I, I believe that he was the one who sort of planted the seed because my dad as a child used to go with him. And I remember my dad's story when he said the first time he ever saw a banana um i think it was uh yeah they were they were working with people from libya and they gave him dates and, and bananas and my dad ate started eating the whole banana because he had no idea that you have to peel it and so the people who were there they no 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 then they started showing him and obviously they, they my dad didn't speak english so 
but it was also that that whole interesting way of how people communicate and how well we can communicate even without language um, and so that was always present um, and then my dad used to also do some work there so we were always exposed to people from different cultures, even though we lived in a communist uh, country at that time that was sort of very closed off. Um, and as a child, I remember the stories uh, my grandparents used to tell when they traveled to different places in Europe um, and also further abroad. And, and my grandpa had a lot of different drawings that he would make of local people. So we have these drawings now here in our house uh, when he was in Italy. So it's it's really, really interesting that you, you know, you asked me these questions because I started looking, um, thinking about it and kind of looking into where did this start? And I think if I were to point to one person, it would be him probably. It's so interesting you say that. My, my own story, if people have heard it, is with my grandparents moving from India to East Africa and they went on to set up a grocery shop and it became one of the biggest grocery shops in first in uh, Kenya then in Uganda but it meant that it had a lot of the Europeans that would visit that grocery grocery shop to buy their groceries so it wasn't I don't think it was an intentional desire to let's you know start a business that is selling to people internationally but just the nature of the business they were doing those are the people that came in and this meant that they had to learn bits of the language for sure and you know English being the sort of universal language that works here so it, it led them to learning English but also the mannerisms in which they operate so slightly more jokey British bantery style and I can see that in the way that my uncles especially are they're some of the funniest people that I know um, or you know, with with other nations where it's like, okay, you have to be quite to your word, right? In in terms of, okay, if you promise something to Europeans, they kind of expect it. Whereas the cultures they came from, there's a lot more flexibility in the sense of like, okay, we'll say yes, and we'll then figure out if we could deliver it or we can do it, right? So being for, forced to make that adjustment, you become more adept at just being adaptable to different people and being like, okay, these these guys operate that way if we want repeat business if we want them to come back to this grocery shop we have to be personable in this way but also business minded in in that way um i've had another guest who said the same thing where uh, he's Liu Liu and he's from china but then his grandparents also interacted with a lot of western europeans and yeah it's interesting you say the same thing so it shows how impactful their business or their you know version of growing up and what they were doing can really have that knock-on effect for sure i think more so than we even realized right because it's not something that was there right away from me i thought okay what where did it start so yeah it's that subconscious uh... were your grandparents born in d uh, different parts of poland and then they met or were they born in the same area they were born in the same area and they met um, right after the war, Second World War ended and then had two kids. So that was my dad and his sister. Um, so we were quite local, our, our family, when we trace it back, because my dad is very interested in, in our um, family history. So he's actually doing a, a whole tree, family tree and tracing things back. So we had been um, in this area, our part of the family for a very long time. The other parts of the family were scattered more across uh, different regions of Poland, uh, but not too far off. And did you see how that, you know, the, the way that your grandparents' lives panned out, how that may have influenced how your parents were raised and the mentality that they formed growing up? I believe, you know, when I look at it, it was, it was, um, it was traditional and it wasn't in a way because we had different different uh, roles, right? Women played different roles and men played different roles than they do now. Um, so in that sense, it was quite traditional. But on the other hand, I believe that this aspect of travel and being open and being really open to other cultures and experiences definitely trickled into you know how my dad was raised. And I think he had that because he also traveled when I was little. Um, and the reason I believe my parents took that huge leap and decided to leave our, our home country 
when there was an opportunity and we moved abroad was probably because of that, because it was, you know, it was risky. And, but I think he saw that, you know, it does, it's not that scary that people, we share certain aspects, right? And, and also um, I think because relationships were important in our families so friendships relationships people always stayed in touch with people even though they would live in different places so you had this sort of network and safety net spanning across the world so that you knew uh when we moved we had you know family friends that were there and they helped us and they took care of us in the beginning um but I definitely think there was a there was a big influence um, that allowed them to take that leap. My mom, I would say a bit less, I think less. She was a bit more skeptical, probably a bit more frightened uh, because it was also her first experience where she was going abroad, moving uh, or even going uh, abroad. So that was definitely um, something that was new. Um, the other thing I think is, you know, when I look at the women, they were all very strong females, um, even though we could say some of the roles were traditional, but they were opinionated, they were outspoken, they were definitely very resilient. Um, and uh, when I look at my mom and her sisters, they were all career oriented. So they were women who were already back then focused on having their own careers, having their own independence in a way. And that's how I was brought up. I love that. And is that something that you saw was supported by your grandparents to make that? Because like you say, you know, there's a traditional side where there is more of a a character role played by males and females and genders at the time. But, you know, the sense of having that exposure to different cultures, did you see how that played out? And well, actually, they were given that support to be a bit more independent and resilient and kind of follow a, a maybe more unconventional route compared to others. I think I saw it more with, you know, the next generation, but I also don't know all the details and I can't really ask them anymore. I, it's the story I get from my dad and his sister. But like when we're looking at my, my grandparents, paternal grandparents, my grandmother was a stay at home uh, mom. Um, and I believe that it was also by choice because I think my grandfather, as I said, was very open minded. So if she had wanted to have a career, I don't think there would have been any issue, but she chose to stay at home to focus on the kids. And um, so so in that sense, I wouldn't say directly that was that sort of picture that was painted. But I definitely saw it with, you know, with my mom and, and my dad, where my grandparents were very supportive of their careers and also helping out with me. Um, so absolutely, they, they stepped up and, and they understood that, you know, times were different, but also that this is what my mom wanted. And, and of course, they would be there to support her. And at the time that your parents did decide to move, something that I notice in a lot of stories is that though on a lot of cases there was a trend at that time where people were leaving that country sometimes it could be because like it was politically unstable there was a war but there are cases where you find that they were quite the um out of the box like uh, unordinary ones to do it what was the case like for you were, was there a trend where people tended to be moving or were they quite different to others that they grew up around so it was after the martial law was lifted in Poland. Um, there was a window of opportunity, and it was exactly as what you're saying. There, there was there was this sort of mass uh, of people that decided now is the time because we don't know what would happen afterwards, and of course things closed down again, and there was no opportunity. And for us, it was no one knew what would happen. Uh, no one could foresee the future, and definitely not you know no one thought that that was what was going to happen. Um, but yeah, we left at that time. Um, and the stories were, you know, there were so many different stories, but we left with three suitcases because you weren't allowed to leave. I mean, we were going on a vacation, sort of say. <laughs> um, and so there was no turning back. So you left. I didn't know this. I was a child. But for my parents, they knew that they might never return again. They would never see their family again. Um, so I think it was a very, very difficult decision. I think it was quite courageous to do that also with a child. 
Um, but I think the motivation was greater, right? Instead of staying, um, you had this opportunity and this vision of, of a better life. And I think that's, that's what people did that decided to leave. Um, so yeah, I think the, the risk was, was big. Um, it definitely paid off. I mean, I see the benefits as well, but, um, I don't think it was an easy decision for anybody. Some of the bits that you touch on there is, you know, taking a decision where you knew it'd be difficult to turn back, uh, wasn't always an easy decision. A lot of these things are, if it was talked about in the current day, you would speak about people being entrepreneurial or big risk takers, right? Stepping into the world of the unknown instead of taking the safe path. And it's something that I've really learned the value of that this idea of being an entrepreneur is not something that has come about in the last few decades right it's it's embedded in centuries it's just appears in different forms and so you know you can almost see how oh i saw the way they behaved in entrepreneurial way and how that can have impacted how you then perceived what is or is not possible but in this case what is possible right it's whether it was directly or indirectly told to you by your parents of you know chase something that has a potential upside but you don't know what's on the other side of that door um yeah that 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 impact has is one of the strong generational uh, influences that i tend to see amongst people who do then decide like you know i found i found i found something for myself uh, and i really want to turn that into something that's more than a passion but an actual purpose for me i think it's also that you know you you have to hone in on your skills and really be, be innovative because very rarely have I met people along the way, you know, when I was called an immigrant in the United States and, and, and then back in Poland, everyone around me has always managed to do things in, in ways that seem impossible. They somehow, you know, people come together, they pull in their skills, their resources, and they're able to learn and to create and to do even my parents, my parents had completely different uh, careers when we were in the United States. My dad went from being someone who couldn't really even like put a nail in the wall. Sorry, dad, but <laughs> that's the truth to being someone who had his own business with cabinet. Uh, you know, he made um, uh, cabinet furniture, uh, designed furniture for people. So it was it was just really amazing also to see that whole journey, because if you have to, and you have to find a way you will right it's exactly what you're saying about entrepreneurs um so many people start businesses where they never thought that this potentially would be something that they are focused on and developing uh, ideas or products but they do it but i think the biggest um lesson probably for me was that you can't do it alone I, yeah i think uh, that is something that a lot of people try to do and i you know i don't want to go down the rabbit hole of you know the loneliness epidemic that's come out since covid and how especially when you're pursuing your own it's something that i call the lonely chapter like when you're really pursuing something that's your own ambition so that could be in business or even if it is moving to a new country there's this this phase which is that lonely chapter which is where you do start to question i've left my herd i've left my pack it is you know have i done the right thing you know we're, we're built to we're built to not want to ever feel uh, out of place or undervalued. And it, it goes back to like our tribal mentality of if you leave your pack, then you're more at risk of um, death or whatever it may be. So in the same way that, yeah, exactly. So that, that loneliness thing is huge in terms of, so moving from Poland to the U S two countries where, and you know, you can tell me more about could be quite culturally different what do you do you remember what those feelings of culture shock were if there were any and how did that play into that feeling of not wanting to be alone so before we got to the united states we made a quick stop in germany <laughs> so that was the first place um and it was southern germany it was nuremberg so it was very very interesting it was a completely different culture um, very traditional and 
of course, what I'm telling you is from, you know, a child's perspective, because my reality was very different to what my parents were facing as adults um, moving. And, but for me, I have to say, and I've always said this, and I feel really grateful and very fortunate that I had never, ever faced anybody who didn't want me to be a part of a group. Uh, to, you know, even at recess playing, I, we were, I was always exposed to children and adults who were very inclusive, very open, very kind. Um, and I think that also made a difference for me because in Germany, that was the first time I ever went to, we had an international class in a German school because they were teaching us German. And also it was part of the integration program to then have these kids that were immigrants um, enter the German schools with fluent German language and yeah, just function normally. So it was the first time I was ever exposed to a class. I don't even remember how many there were of us, but there were kids from all over the world. So it was from Africa, Hungary, uh, Czech Republic. Uh, I mean, you could, if you lined us up, I have pictures and I love those pictures because we're all so different. Um, but we never focused on that. I think we focused right away on the fact that we all felt a sense of belonging because we had similar journeys. Um, and, you know, also the hardship of leaving your family, of, of, of being in a very new place that bonded us a lot. And our teacher was wonderful. She was she was such a kind and empathetic person. Um, she was a German teacher. Um, I don't know if she ever had any experience herself living abroad, but she was just so wonderful at giving this warm atmosphere so that all the kids that would come in, because we had that kids would come and some would leave um, and some were there before, for example, I arrived. So they transitioned to the German classes earlier. But she was just great at making the safe space for all of us. Um, and I don't know if it's because of my grandfather or the stories or being exposed to certain things. I never looked at these. I never had a moment where I thought, OK, this this person is different than I am. They look different. That never happened. Um, yeah, so I, I think that was interesting because when I think about it now, I think that, you know, it could have been that I thought to myself, we're, well, we don't look the same, how come, or questioning this, and that was never the case. I mean, this point around empathy, right? This interesting thing that I um, discovered in a conversation that I had with someone who works in the um, sort of performing art space as a, a script writer and a, an actress, and she was talking about how she still to this day works with some people where maybe their perception of a certain character in a script they were writing has to be displayed with such a strong stereotype. And it was it was the role of someone who was of like black African descent. And the dialogue that was written was really stereotypical to the point where she was saying that w no one would actually speak like that. It's It's really not representative. And the director didn't really understand. He's like, oh, no, it's fine. And it took a lot of escalating for her to get him to realize like this is not the way that we actually speak and it's the point of you know when you're brought up around a homogenous group of people or culture a lot of the perception that you will get of what people from a certain background will usually be based on <clears throat> what you watch in the media right so it's quite common that uh, you'll see a show like narcos and you think you know the this central american or mexican guatemalan drug cartel is the definition of what someone from that region is because you've never been exposed Completely. to them. yeah 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 but i think because you asked me about the culture shock i think and this is funny because we started with food and i will continue that i think for me it's also the circumstances right we came from a communist country and when we left um food, we had food stamps, food was limited. It was really, you know, it wasn't really something that I wish upon anyone. But for me, I think one of the biggest culture shocks was, I remember it was the second day we had been in Germany and my aunt took me to the grocery store because my parents left some pocket change for me so I would buy myself, you know, a chocolate or something. And I remember walking into the grocery store and it was just a different world. I thought, how can this be? 
that not so far away where we have empty shelves here, it was just unbelievable. All the fruit. I remember the smell of these oranges and then my aunt taking me to the to the chocolate aisle. It was an aisle. And I thought, this is not real that you just have all of this, this abundance. Right. So I think it was interesting from a child's perspective to think about how can there be so much, so much food and so much goodness <laughs> compared to what I was used to. And then the the behavior, right, that I remember taking one little bar and I was very happy with that. And my aunt said, no, no, you can take more. You, We can. And I said, no, no, it's fine. It's OK. Uh, I'm good. Um, so I think it's also when I think back now to what we're used to and how we consume and how, you know, the world is, it was just such a big difference. Um, that was probably my biggest culture shock. And then, of course, it was also, you know, of I remember how I thought everything was very clean and orderly and and how people just, you know, were more free in the sense. I think it was everything that I grew up with where we were so limited and so closed off and so controlled. So that was probably the biggest culture shock that that I experienced. Do you think before we move on to the experience of the US um in the point that you're mentioning and it goes back to this you know cross cultural awareness piece countries like Germany where they are seen as quite orderly and timely and you know it's a great example of when we talk about the prof- professional context they set strict times and agendas um and all of these fronts and that will stem from a history of having quite a lot of um discipline in place right right but then where it's kind of a self-imposed understanding of uh becoming disciplined rather than like you say coming from somewhere where it's kind of ordered in that way do you think that also plays out in what you were seeing in like you say like the environment where it was a lot cleaner because people are a lot more um sort of self-disciplined around keeping that sense of cleanliness rather than you know some cultures not necessarily St. Poland but they are more chaotic or flexible in their approach right doing things off the cuff and on the whim and not having to worry about attention to detail but more having the faith that things will get done yeah do you think that had an, an has an impact on the kind of way that the surroundings of of places that you grow up are set up I mean, definitely, you know, I'm I'm currently sitting in Copenhagen. And, and so, again, we can take there are a lot of differences between Denmark and Germany. But the one thing that I see is is definitely more. It's also the trust factor. I think when people trust their governments more institutions, uh, the rules are also obeyed in different ways, uh, whereas in a lot of cultures where that doesn't exist it's almost defying it going against it right okay they're telling us to do this we will do the opposite or so it's kind of a self-destructive behavior that occurs um whereas in these countries um you see that people believe that this is for the good of all right and and also the the mentality denmark has for example we're responsible for each other so as people living in this country we take that on um, and we make sure that it's clean, that people are not destroying things, that people are not harming each other. And so if you see someone who has fallen, you will go and ask that person, do you need help? So there is a lot of this community behavior, but I do believe it stems from trust. Um, and so definitely, because I came from chaos where people didn't trust the government, the police, because those were the people who were inflicting, uh, you know, a lot of the pain and destruction. So, yeah, I, and I think it's difficult to get to bring change. Um, I think it's ingrained in us. And, you know, it's even though we say no, you know, generations have passed. But I think a lot of these things are there. They're present, even though we don't think about it or we don't realize it. We replicate certain behaviors. This is really interesting because something that is one of the main topics of understanding when it comes to cultural differences is that uh, approach to hierarchy and it plays out in so many elements right so 
that whole concept of power distance and power distance is the acceptance and expectance of leaders or bosses to guide you and the example that you gave somewhere like Sweden or Denmark is they're one of the most flat hierarchy structures where even though there is an appointed leader they're almost treated as a peer especially in organizations but probably even in the government where it is we are in this together they almost don't like to be fully ordered and guided but going back to your point it um I think it really plays out where on the flip side where there is quite a hierarchy set up there's quite a lot of influence that the boss or the system yeah will have where if if it is uh, because because the power distance is what you expect and accept of them if they are doing a good job then you can see how that can play out in like a company being run better because people are more productive. They trust their boss more. They want to give back more to organization. But in the same setting, if there's a clear hierarchy in a country where it's being run not in the way that the people of the country, same as the employees of a company, want it to be run, then you can start to see that disorder. So you can really see how... Yeah, you can really see how much the the weight then falls on the the leaders to have to set up the sort of culture and groundwork for the the country or the company to be operated the right way. Exactly. And you see, you know, like I see it in the work that I do as well, where people say you have people coming from different countries into Denmark and they say, this is just so strange. I don't understand my manager or, you know, the 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 director. They're they're not doing what they should be doing what they why why are they always asking us things and it's so normal because here it's consensus right and everyone should ask questions they should actually challenge uh the management uh this is what you know we're thinking of doing and and you will have in meetings people say well i think that's not the best way maybe we should do it this way and so for many people from from very hierarchical or, or you know coming back from those backgrounds they they find this strange they find this abnormal uncomfortable for sure because you're not supposed to do that you're not supposed to challenge the person who has a higher title and say that's not right or i think it should be done this way but then again it's the trust factor right if you're you know that you're okay also when you lose your job in these countries here, right? It's it's very different from when you lose your job in the US. It's very different from when you lose your job in Poland. Um, So there is that safety net again, it shows up, right? It's the trust, it's the safety that you know you'll be okay. Um, So it's very complex. But I think it also, as you said, it oftentimes we it comes up and up again because people are not used to certain things and they're at work, especially this is something that's very prominent people, you know, that's the first thing that they they encounter this flat structure and how it's not just something that we talk about or on paper, it's real Um, and it's very much every day you see it being activated. You mentioned the um, the differences that somewhere like US serves. So on moving there, what were those stark differences that you saw in, what, what, how old are you when you went there? I was 10. Well, yeah, so really at the age where you're still quite malleable to the things that you're picking up from the surroundings around you. Formative years, yes, yeah. definitely, yeah. What did you notice were those stark differences during those years that you grew up? I think, you know, and I'm speaking about a U.S. that doesn't exist anymore. That's also something we need to keep in mind. That was many, many years ago. Um, I think what I noticed was definitely the fact this American dream that we used to talk about when we talked about immigrants, that was still very real. If you came, and this is not necessarily what I believe now, but I'm just using the words of that time. If you came and you worked hard, you would be able to have a very good life. And that was a fact. We came, my parents worked really hard. And they also, you know, made a lot of effort to to speak fluent English, to um, really be engaged, um, to make sure that we 
also lived in a place that was safe. Uh, because when we came, we lived in Chicago, we lived downtown with friends. Um, and that was not a reality for us because all the kids that were there went to a private school. My parents obviously could not afford a private school at that time. So for us, the option was to move to the suburbs where I would be going to a public school that was free. Um, and that's exactly what we did. But in order to do so, they also had to work that summer very hard and save up money so that we would be able to rent an apartment. So, you know, down, they would be able to pay three months rent and so on and so forth to get that. Um, and that's what we did. Uh, but again, I have to say it's through community and through people who want you to succeed as well that this was possible because you know, it's very difficult to come somewhere and have no network and not have anyone who will be cheering you on. And, you know, my dad's first job was through his uh, his friend um, that he knew from the time he was a child. And then they moved to the United States um, way, way before everything that happened in Poland. But they kept in touch. And he was the person who gave my dad his first job. So it it's yeah, it I mean, that's what I mean, that, you know, you cannot do it alone. People. You need people. Um, and as we said before, we're also made that way. I think it's difficult to be somewhere and feel really alone. We always had people around us. We always had a community. We had um, these aunts and uncles who were also Polish, but you know, obviously they weren't family, but we created a family. Um, but I think the big difference was that people were able to live together and they were all different once again because you know we we had people coming from different parts of the world we had the we had the latinos we had the the african americans at that time that's what they were called and i went to school with people also of different backgrounds of different religions i had many jewish friends i had friends from all over the world and it just worked and it seemed very effortless we we you know we went to school together we played sports together my parents worked with people also from different parts of the world and it wasn't so difficult um it just worked i think that was a huge um eye opener for me and also the fact that in the us it was it was also different in the sense that for example to denmark now that people were very open and inviting so we would go over to people's houses all the time because that was the norm if you met someone and you know you click you like each other people would invite you over for dinner or coffee especially if you had kids and they were the same age so it was just I remember a lot of that, a lot of visiting different people and and also, you know, bringing food and them coming to our house and, and just different activities. So it was very much centered around togetherness and not necessarily only with our Polish community. So so again, I grew up with that, that my parents never cared where someone came from or what religion they were. People were always welcome and we also liked to go and explore how, you know, how do they live? What do they eat? How do they celebrate? Um, so that was something I definitely grew up with and saw that it was important. I hear this a lot where when people do move to a new country, they often do find it easier, but also able to make new friends especially during schooling years of people that have also come from different backgrounds and have found themselves there i.e they've come from some kind of immigrant background because you're almost brought together in a similarity of being different right so you're in a place where you are all quote unquote outsiders and that brings you together because you're related by that did you find that you were also making you know local friends i.e like local born in america born and bred in america friends or did it tend to be people who had come from a, a story of a, a background from somewhere else it was definitely both groups let's call it that but i think it was again because we were in an environment where no one cared i don't think that was we looked at each other in that way that oh you know my friend edna for example she came from mexico her parents were immigrants like my i don't think that was ever anything that we made an issue or anyone focused on it and i think it might be also particular to you know the people my group of friends uh, or the school i was at or maybe that they were also exposed it was never an issue ever i want to touch on something that you also mentioned and i know you did say that america has kind of shifted 
uh, away from the time when you were there. It's actually something I read and I wanted to get your opinion. So it talks about you know, the task-based versus the relationship-based um, societies or cultures that people come from. And obviously just for a very quick background lesson in what the differences are, relationship-based cultures are where it takes a longer time to build those relationships, but then they tend to stay firmer and stronger. And especially in the business sense, it takes a longer time to do deals or build a partnership because they want to get to know you on a personal level. So you kind of cross that boundary between your personal and professional life. Then you've got the task-based societies where it tends to be a bit more defined that this is a business relationship or this is a personal relationship. Neither one is right or wrong, but a task-based approach, you tend to get into business quicker just as much as you can tend to get out of business quicker. The thing I read though was um, it was saying that task-based societies like UK, US and Australia as they're typically termed, those relationships are designed by functionality and practicality and it's relatively easy to move around in and out of networks. So if a business relationship proves unsatisfactory to either party, then it's a matter of closing that door and moving on to another. Do you agree that that is the case in a personal sense as well? See, that's hard. I mean, I stay away from generalizations. Uh, and so for me, when I when I read such things, uh, I'm always very careful in, in the water that I'm treading. Uh, I think it's personal. I think it depends on the situation. I think it depends on who we're dealing with. Um, and again, I could bring Denmark into this as well, because that's the first thought I had. Denmark is considered to be a task-based uh, society also in the workplace, right? Um, it's very difficult. You're not really friends with your, your co-workers. Uh, work is work. And after work, people go home and they have their personal relationships. You don't go out on Fridays with your colleagues in Denmark. You have what is called Friday bar, but it's at work. But on the other hand, as an entrepreneur in Denmark, everything is trust-based. It was very much, for me, relationship-based. So the places I worked at, uh, we were all friends in the workplace, outside of the workplace. So it wouldn't be just a matter of closing a door and, and moving on. And I don't think it's fair for us. We can have this as a reference, but I think we always need to check in with people. We need to find out what their story is. So this cultural identity is also very fluid in a way. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree with what you say about that cultural fluidity. And this whole interest in the space of like the cultural relativity and understanding it, was that something that you can pinpoint to when that really became an interest that you thought, hang on, you know, there's something to this that I want to start really diving into and potentially becoming something that you teach to others. It was a personal interest I had even when I was very young because I saw the challenges and what I experienced, uh, the feeling of this duality of not really belonging to a place. I thought, how come we keep replaying these same scenarios, there have to be solutions that make this easier. And I think that's what made me really dive into it because I thought it can't be that we will just continue this way. Yeah, I really like that you use the word uh, struggle, which some people might think uh, is controversial in what it is because it's kind of an awareness piece. But, you know, one of the most interesting reports that I read was talking about how one of the top power skills for a leader or a manager by 2026 and in the top five one of them was cultural intelligence and it's a term that you know you have IQ which has traditionally been the way that uh, by traditionally I mean a few decades ago if a manager or a leader had a high IQ where they knew had like good analytical skills and problem solving skills, then they could lead a company to do really well. And then over time, as you had a more diverse range of people join companies, but also as, and you touched on it as well, kind of as we moved away from um, people getting 
jobs done in a very industrial sense of you know being productive and how much can you churn out in the nine to five or how many hours you work and it became more of people want to build trust with the organization they work in or they want to have trust in the the government that manages them then having a high eq became super important how emotionally intelligent is your leader or your manager now as the world has become more globally diverse in terms of the cultures that people are working for it's no longer the case of okay i am from england and i want to do business with someone from france or even someone from serbia for example now it's the case of as my company grows i may have people from these backgrounds working for me because either they live here now because there's a lot more global movement or because a lot more companies are hiring remotely you now have you know, hiring taking place in different cultures. So the fact that it's been identified by leaders that they recognize this as one of the top five power skills for the next two years, you know, it's amazing to see that you just, you lived an experience that generated a personal interest, but you've also kind of realized the power that it serves in helping people not just expand their own social connection and network, but even professionally, if they want to really expand they need to have a, an awareness of how to be able to navigate conversations with different clients or even with employees that work in their organization. For sure. And I think if I were to specify it even more, I think communication is the biggest issue that we're dealing with. I think one thing is, you know, the emotional intelligence, the cultural intelligence, having having the awareness but I think we're lacking skills to communicate with one another. As some, I see time and time again, I think we've stepped away from being curious and being more student oriented to being all knowing. This is really, this is really an interesting point that you raise because, you know, even though we're speaking on understanding the nuances of different cultures, when it boils down to it, there's certain human traits and tendencies that we all have that ultimately makes us human and you may have heard how the average person overestimates their own abilities so if you look at someone i think it's 70 percent of people think they're above an average level of driving ability so 70 percent think they're better than 50 percent and it's a it's a common that's one of the the key examples that people often like over inflate what they think their iq is but on the flip side when it comes to perceptions, it's so interesting that we perceive, firstly, that the way we feel is how people then perceive us. But, you know, there's a case of there was a study done where people were purposely felt, uh, uh, purposely fed food that they didn't like um, to see how they reacted to it. And most of the time they thought that they'd made it really obvious to the the person who cooked the meal that they didn't like it but they the person never knew because we're quite good at actually hiding our expressions um so even though internally we feel guilty or that we're lying it's not often seen in that way and so in the same way of what you're saying about that vulnerability and and kind of admitting that you've messed up again in the same way we um normally perceive that any sort of like faux pas or error that we've made or misjudgment um, that the other person negatively perceives us uh, in the same way that we view ourselves when really we we tend to negatively perceive ourselves probably twice or even more as much um, in the same way that if what we tend to take from an interaction is okay, did that person have a good energy? Uh, did that person have a, do we have a valuable conversation? Do I trust them? And we don't really pay that much attention to that little slip up that mm -hmm. they made, but we for ourselves will massively exactly. exaggerate that, that slip yeah. up. And um, have you heard of this term called like, I, th I think it's called like the beautiful mess effect. Um, it's this idea, uh, it, it's, it's, it's one of those things that you will know but it's given a fancy name for no reason because why not it's just the idea of how you know when you see someone that does slip up uh whether they're giving a board meeting or they're on stage or even someone who's like performing a concert 
it's not the error but they, that they make, but it's the way they deal with it that draws us more to them. So when you see someone where it's like, oh, their mic cut out or they, they ac- accidentally slipped or they spilt their coffee, if they deal with it in a really graceful way, it actually makes us trust them and feel so much more connected with them because they haven't tried to hide up uh, or hide their uh, flaw or their accident, but it's just part of what happens. And I think this idea is... Uh, as it's kind of kind of goes in on the flip side of what we're talking about here which is understanding cultures but i think you're right you know just understanding how to connect with an individual and accepting the fact that people appreciate the honesty and authenticity of people being vulnerable to their own mistakes and being able to know how to deal with it and and own up to it actually brings trust and relationships a lot closer respectful curiosity i call it but also We have a feeling. Why do we like some people and not like other people? Very often it's this, right? So as you said, right, making people feel heard and seen, acknowledging them, we're interested. I love that. And yeah, there's a, you know, the the leader of a low performing team asks on average, I think, nine questions. Um, Whereas it was found that like the leader and manager of high performing teams asks on average 36 questions, right? And it just shows the the curiosity but also the ability to admit that you don't actually know everything but you want to find out and that's why you have a team uh yes it it just started me how big that number difference is between just being able to ask questions as a as a manager or leader uh can determine whether you have a high or low performing team we do have a closing tradition on the show and that is a question that I ask all of the guests that I have, and it ties into the whole concept of roots to roots. So if you had one message that you could write on a piece of paper and it would be opened by the future generation and you would hope that they would read it and live by it, what would that message say? That's big. Um, so there's there are a few things. We need to ask a lot of questions, so be curious. And I think that every person has a need to be heard and seen. 